The 1990s were a roller coaster in wrestling. It was a 10 year span that saw the WWF fall from its perch as the number one wrestling promotion in the world, and 1995 was an especially rough year for the company. In fact, it's largely regarded as one of the worst years in WWE history amongst fans. It was a year that saw Vince McMahon spiral into panic as his wrestling business started to swirl the drain at an alarming rate as television ratings and pay-per-view buy rates sank. In 1993, McMahon was charged by the US Department of Justice for anabolic steroid-related crimes. Lucky for him, he was acquitted in 1994. While McMahon got away with his freedom intact, he stopped focusing on wrestlers with superhuman physiques and instead began promoting wrestlers that looked a little more ordinary. Bret Hart was one of the lucky superstars that was elevated to the main event and spent most of 1994 as WWF champion. In the era of Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage and the Ultimate Warrior, Hart probably wouldn't have gotten a look in as a main eventer, but now the era of the superhuman was long gone. It was time for 5'11 Bret Hart to be WWF champion. The fans really seemed to connect with Hart as the company's number one babyface, but that enthusiasm wasn't translating into ticket sales and TV ratings like McMahon wanted. And so, he threw his hands up in the air and reverted to type. If he couldn't have a superhuman muscle man as his company figurehead, then he'd crown someone really tall instead. And so, in November 1994, Diesel became WWF champion. Which brings us to January 1995 and the Royal Rumble. Shawn Meistery is the first superstar to win the Royal Rumble from the number one position. However, the feat is less impressive than it sounds. For this edition of the Royal Rumble, the decision was made for wrestlers to enter the match at intervals of one minute, instead of the usual two minutes, making the match much shorter than ever at just 38 minutes in total. The other effect that shorter entries had was to make the entire match more chaotic, and not in a good way. The lack of quality on the roster at the time was laid bare in 1995's Royal Rumble match as the likes of Quang, Duke the Dumpster Drozzy and Mantar came out to entertain us. It was almost like McMahon made the match shorter in order to get it over and done with quicker, knowing how crap his roster was at the time. Elsewhere on the card, the finals of a tournament to crown new tag team champions saw Bob Holly and the 1-2-3 kid defeat Bam Bam Bigelow and Tatonka. But the real story came after the match when Bigelow lost his call after being ridiculed by football star Lawrence Taylor, who was sitting at ringside. That led to a shoving contest between the men. That interaction would be very significant later down the road. On the undercard, Diesel wrestled Bret Hart, for the WWF Championship in a rare babyface versus babyface match that ended in a draw after lots of interference. Before the finish, it was a really decent match and probably one of Kevin Nash's best ever matches in fact. The Royal Rumble event wasn't great overall, but it would be far from the worst WWF pay-per-view of 1995. It was a real sign of the times that the WWF couldn't even sell out one of their biggest shows of the year in one of their biggest marketplaces of Tampa, Florida. Just 10,000 fans came out to see the show live. I mean, take a look at this awful pay-per-view poster too. No wonder the fans weren't interested. WrestleMania 11's poster was piss poor too, and the show itself wasn't much better. WrestleMania had never looked so small time as it took place at the Hartford Civic Center in Connecticut in front of a tiny crowd of just 16,000 fans, and the card featured just seven matches. Incredibly, McMahon decided to run with Bam Bam Bigelow versus Lawrence Taylor in the main event. On the undercard, Bret Hart beat Bob Backlund in one of Hart's worst ever performances and easily his worst ever WrestleMania match. And who can blame Hart for being disheartened? No pun intended. At WrestleMania 10, he beat Yokozuna to become WWF champion and it must have felt incredible 
to be finally given the ball to run with, especially after living under Hulk Hogan's glass ceiling for so many years. Now all that faith was gone, McMahon had made Hart drop the title to Bob Backlund at the Survivor Series in 1994 in order for him to drop the title to Diesel just a few days later. McMahon didn't want babyface Brett to drop the belt to babyface Diesel directly, so he used heel Bob Backlund as a transitional champion. As we'll see, McMahon forced Hart down to the mid-card through 1995, but the fans would cling on to him as their hero. At WrestleMania 11, Diesel retained his WWF title against Shawn Michaels. Diesel might have won the match, but he was totally overshadowed by Shawn Michaels' performance. And despite Kevin Nash and Shawn Michaels being best buddies in real life, Michaels put in an over-the-top effort that essentially turned him into a babyface. The WWF really lost the plot when it came to booking the true WrestleMania main event. Bam Bam Bigelow was a hot prospect at one point in his career. He was an agile big man that really knew how to wrestle. But this WrestleMania headline match was not about him. It was about the baffling decision to put a football player over at the granddaddy of them all. While Lawrence Taylor performed relatively well as a non-wrestler, he still beat an actual WWF superstar. However, it can't be discounted how much trouble the WWF was in back in 1995. McMahon thought that hot-shotting a major celebrity into the WrestleMania main event in an actual wrestling match would help revive the ailing fortunes of his business, but it wasn't to be. As we know now, it would take another year and a half for McMahon to wake up and realise that his entire presentation of wrestling was all wrong for the 1990s, and publicity stunts like this were not going to change things. McMahon was going to need more cash flow into the business if he was to survive the decade, and so 1995 was the year that he introduced the In Your House monthly pay-per-view concept. Not only were these monthly events designed to give fans more competitive matches and storylines to enjoy, but they would also give the company a nice new, regular monthly income, especially at a time when fans weren't coming out to watch the shows live. The first In Your House event was in May 1995, and it was mostly terrible. Bret Hart was kept miles away, from the main event scene by actually opening the show in an excellent match against Hakushi. The main event was a match between Diesel and Psycho Sid. Big Sid had been rehired by the WWF in February 1995, and since Brett and Sean had already faced Diesel, McMahon needed more fodder for his champion. The match between Diesel and Sid was atrocious, and Sid even managed to injure Diesel via his powerbomb. The In Your House 1 pay-per-view did a pretty decent buy rate of 332,000. However, that number would quickly slide as the year went on, and by In Your House 4 in October 1995, the buy rate was down to a measly 90,000. Fans parted with their dollars for this first show through curiosity, and then the fact that they were giving away an actual house, believe it or not. It would be the first and the last time that they tried that particular publicity stunt. The King of the Ring event took place in June and that show also stank the joint out. Bret Hart had been even further demoted by McMahon who had forced him into a horrible feud with Jerry Lawler. On this show, Hart beat Lawler in a kiss my foot match that nobody wanted to see. In the main event, Diesel was quickly proving to be a poor choice of WWF champion. This was still the era where the champion was judged on their drawing power and Diesel wasn't drawing a dime. The main event was a tag team match in which Diesel teamed with Bam Bam Bigelow to defeat Psycho Sid and Tatonka. The match never got out of first gear and dragged on for 17 minutes. The event isn't remembered for that boring main event, however. Instead, it's lamented for the result of the King of the Ring tournament. It was a tournament that originally included the WWF's actual superstars at the time. The likes of Razor Ramon, Yokozuna, Lex Luger, Shawn Michaels, Jeff Jarrett and the Undertaker were all in this tournament at the beginning, and yet it was won by Mabel, of all people. 
McMahon just couldn't let his fetish for big men go. To his credit, McMahon had done a great job with Yokozuna a few years before, but Mabel, on the other hand, would not be accepted by the fans as a main eventer. The 16,000 Philadelphia fans in attendance that night registered their disgust by loudly chanting ECW after Mabel won the once prestigious tournament. Mabel had been in a tag team with Mo, and they formed the Men on a Mission, a half-wrestling, half-rapping tag team. In the mid-90s era of ultra-cool rap groups like the Wu-Tang Clan and the Fugees, this pair stood out like complete idiots. Mabel's win came out of the blue, and the reaction was terrible, but that didn't stop McMahon from pushing him for a while. Fans around the world groaned as the WWF announced that Diesel vs King Mabel would be the main event of SummerSlam 1995. SummerSlam 1995 was another stinker of a pay-per-view with nine matches on the card and only one of those matches being worth a damn. Shawn Michaels vs Razor Ramon in a ladder match for the Intercontinental title was still one of the best ever ladder matches ever produced. Speaking of the click, the backstage gang became complete in 1995 as Triple H joined the company. At SummerSlam, Hunter Hearst Helmsley defeated Bob Holly in seven minutes in his pay-per-view debut. Elsewhere on the SummerSlam card, Bret Hart's feud with Jerry Lawler continued to plumb new depths. After the Kiss My Foot match earlier in the year, Lawler had introduced his evil dentist to the mix. Isaac Yankum DDS wasn't just an orthodontist, he was also inexplicably a pro wrestler. Hart defeated Yankum via disqualification at SummerSlam in a terrible match and the feud would go on all the way to October. Yankum was played by Glenn Jacobs of course who would go on to play the iconic Kane in the coming years. At the time, Jacobs despaired at this dentist gimmick too. He believed it to be so bad that he thought it would end his career. Many fans still agree to this day that Diesel vs Mabel was one of the worst SummerSlam main events of all time. The match slowed down to a crawl in the middle and then Mabel performed a sit down splash on Diesel that almost paralysed him. According to Nash, after he took the splash he could barely feel his legs. 1995's edition of SummerSlam absolutely bombed in terms of pay per view buys. It pulled 205,000 buys on the night which was three times less than SummerSlam 1989, six years earlier. Vince McMahon's woes got even worse just days after SummerSlam when WCW launched Monday Nitro. Now, WCW was becoming a credible threat to the WWF survival. Lex Luger, who had been under contract to the WWF, showed up on the first episode of Monday Nitro in an appearance that nobody, including Vince McMahon, ever saw coming. Throughout the rest of 1995, Raw and Nitro traded ratings before WCW jetted off into the lead. The quality of the In Your House pay-per-views got progressively worse. It's like they had no idea how to write their show from month to month. In October, the WWF returned to Canada for their first pay-per-view there since WrestleMania 6 in 1990, and it was a disaster. In Your House 4 is arguably the lowest point of the worst year in WWF history. They reached absolute rock bottom on this show. The pay-per-view featured just six televised matches headlined by Diesel and the British Bulldog for the WWF title. Vince McMahon reportedly threw his headset down in anger after the show went off the air, yelling how horrible the main event was. The main event was so bad that it would prompt McMahon to abandon Diesel as his company figurehead the month after. McMahon was also let down by his remaining golden child in Shawn Michaels, who had gotten into a bar fight with several Marines in the weeks before the show. The Marines injured Michaels so badly that he had to be written off WWF television. Still, McMahon had made up his mind that Shawn Michaels, despite his terrible attitude, would be the new company figurehead in 1996. The eventual plan led to Michaels fulfilling his boyhood dream at WrestleMania 12 in April 1996, but McMahon didn't want Diesel to be anywhere near 
that main event. And so Bret Hart was called on at the Survivor Series in November, where he defeated Diesel to once again become WWF Champion. McMahon certainly wasn't putting his faith in Bret Hart, however. He would just hold the championship until it was time for Michaels to ascend to the top spot in April 96. Things would only get worse for McMahon and the WWF in 1996, with the threat from WCW becoming a real problem. In terms of creative, however, very few years, if any, in WWE history have ever been as bad as 1995.